Good afternoon. Can you see and hear me? Hello, Ramana. Yes, we can see and hear you. We're going to start in uh, two minutes. OK, excellent. Um, just a quick um, uh, info that unfortunately I'll be able to stay for about 30 minutes trying to to do more, but uh, unfortunately, I do have an urgent meeting and I need to attend that. So and, until 2.30 for sure. Uh, you, you mean one uh, at 2.30? Yes, 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 we're aware. No, thank you for that. It, it's, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll make thank the best you. of it. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to the 10th on the agenda webinar organized by the European Liberal Forum. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today to discuss a very important and topical issue, uh, the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which was launched on the 1st of June. And for that, we welcome our two distinguished speakers today, Alonso Garillo and Camino Mortera Martinez. Uh, Due to, uh, due to a change in the schedule of uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a bit of a shorter uh, webinar today, but we'll, we'll go straight to the point. We'll uh, start with the opening interventions of our two distinguished speakers, and then we will have a, a short Q&A session before closing a bit earlier than usual. Nevertheless, the topics will be discussed and we're very, very happy to have you with us. Uh, on this very sunny and warm afternoon in Brussels, at least. 
Now, a couple of house rules before we start. This, uh, this webinar is being recorded because we're going to publish the recording on the ELF YouTube channel afterwards. And we will also publish it on the event page of the ELF website. So if you missed anything, if you want to rewatch it, if you want to share it with your colleagues, you will find all the recordings of all the ELF webinars from the On the Agenda series on the ELF website. Uh, one more thing I would like to mention is that if you have uh, questions already, you can already write them. At the bottom, you should see a Q&A uh, section and you can write your questions there. You can direct them at both speakers or just one speaker now will read them out. And you also have the possibility to upvote your favorite questions or to comment on other people's questions as well. So please feel free to, to use that already in advance of the second part of the event, which will be the discussion. Uh, so without further ado and uh, looking a bit at the clock, we're gonna go straight into the first part of the event, uh, the opening interventions. And we're going to, uh, we're going to start with uh, Ms. Ramona Strugariu. She's an MEP elected in Romania in 2019 member of the Renew Europe group, and she's a member of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice, Home Affairs, and a member of the delegation to the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly, as well as vice chair of the delegation to the EU Moldova Parliamentary Association Committee. So without further ado, Ramona, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to talk about uh, something that we call um, a milestone, a, a historic milestone, as a matter of fact, um, for the protection of the EU budget against fraud, because we are discussing the European public prosecutor uh, today, um, a bit of the story, what, what we can really expect for the future and what is happening. You all know, and we all know, it became operational since the 1st of June, fully operational with some... Um, with some um, exciting uh, developments uh, that we we had to face until the last moment, and that some of them are we, we are still facing, as a matter of fact. But I will get there in a minute. Now, like I said, there is no doubt that this is a historic milestone, um, and that we basically uh, have a structure uh, um, that will investigate, prosecute, and bring to judgment by national courts, um, the perpetrators of uh, offenses uh, practically covered by the fifth directive, as well as ancillary offenses linked to, 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 to them. And Apple, of course, uh, has competence also for investigating cross-border VAT fraud uh, with a total uh, damage of at least 10 million uh, euros. Uh, yes, this is a first Step key one for the union in terms of um, you know enhanced supranational um, judicial cooperation. It does open the door to uh, European jurisdiction in criminal matters. It took a very long time and extremely tense negotiation between the uh, member states, and we are still in the situation of enhanced cooperation. Um, some member states are still not in, which speaks about how difficult it was as a matter of fact. Um, Ireland, Denmark, they have an opt-out in justice and home affairs uh, matters. Uh, like, like you know, um, the Swedish government officials have an opt they are planning to join next year. The greatest problems remain Hungary and Poland. Both uh, full beneficiaries of EU money and EU funds, as we well know, uh, both uh, with Article 7 proceedings starting, started already against them, um, with general, generalized deficiencies in terms of rule of law uh, and respect for the European um, values. Now, um, with uh, the EU budget increasing allocations, as a matter of fact, in, in tackling the effects of the pandemic through the RRF, um, protecting the EU budget in these me member states particularly, and in all member states, I would say, is a big challenge. 
what can we really expect from the European Public Prosecutor's um, Office? Uh, obviously, it does not have a magic wand. Nobody does. In terms of, of uh, decision making and rapid action um, at the level of the union, and this is again something that we should seriously rethink within the Conference for the Future of Europe and take a full advantage of all of the debates there in the direction of the rec recommendations to seriously take a look at this kind of improving the situation where we can have one way or another a magic one that allows us to take fast decisions in really critical situations which has been really, really difficult so far. Um, EPO still has, I would say, a very ambitious mandate um, and an even more ambitious and determined chief prosecutor, uh, Laura Kodusa Kirishi, and she has proven that with the right tools and with the proper will, results can be achieved. What is EPO doing now? Basically, we have a single office operating under 22 different criminal procedural regimes. Yes, so let's, let's take a look at the whole uh, picture. Then it will work with 140 prosecutors across the EU in a decentralized way in 22 languages and with very different methods and technology. As the chief prosecutor herself noted, this has never been attempted before. So this is the first time that we are trying to, to do it. Um, and it has already been a uh, challenge from the very beginning uh, uh, when the negotiations with the council were uh, quite, quite complicated and the, making EPO fully oper operational as a matter of fact was delayed by member states not meeting the deadline for appointing the national delegated prosecutors. Slovenia, whose presidency is coming um, soon, is one of the most recent uh, and complicated examples. Prime Minister Jansa basically decided to invalidate an already uh, completed procedure uh, that was finished in December 2020, then the national delegate delegated prosecutors were not uh, basically appointed for, for six months and all of a sudden for some procedural reasons apparently the government decided to restart the procedure although the prosecutor general said that the procedure was legal and it was properly fulfilled uh, from the, 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 the judiciary point of view. Uh, the, the minister of justice resigned, uh, there was quite a um, a storm on the topic. So um, this is how actually uh, EPO started on the 1st of June. Under these circumstances, Slovenia is still a, uh, an issue and I'm truly hoping that we will have in a, the upcoming uh, a plenary uh, a debate re related to this matter, to this topic, because this is crucial and we cannot remain silent on the topic. I initiated as a matter of fact, a letter calling on uh, the Slovenian uh, government to, to rethink uh, and, and withdraw this decision that is literally ham hampering um, a fundamental procedure and it's also question is also questioning uh, the, 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 the role and the independence of, of, of the judiciary if the political side is getting involved so much in these proceedings. Um, to, to, to refer concretely at what is coming, uh, 750 billion euros plan agreed upon last year, uh, you know it very well, expected to start flowing in July of this year, uh, after all of the member states uh, obviously submit their national recovery um, plans, so Apple needs to be fu fully functional. Um, then about 3,000 cases from the very early start of EPO, uh, which is about three times more than initially estimated. Um, obviously, uh, such a high volume of work uh, was um, expected and we, we continue to, uh, uh, to expect that, but it needs resources. It needs full resources. Uh, we need to budget for the EPO as it is what it actually is, a full body of the union fighting 
fraud and corruption. EPO is not an agency. It's not supposed to function in budget-wise like an agency. It does need all of these resources, full resources in terms of uh, um, uh, money and in terms of human, uh, human resources uh, as well. Uh, basically, um, with negotiations for the 2021 budget, we managed to secure additional funding uh, for the um, office, but as I said, it's still not enough. Um, it is also especially problematic as following discussions with people working uh, in the, the opera, uh, operational, opera, uh, in, uh, the, uh, operating, making basically operational every, uh, every part of the whole structure um, that um, even if extra money was allocated, it was not necessarily dedicated to human resources. Uh, and this uh, sense, as a matter of fact, I, I have tabled amendments uh, to the upcoming own initiative resolution uh, on the 2019 Commission PIF report, um, calling for, for proper resources allocated where it, they have to be allocated because this is uh, key. Now, um, oh, no, if I may, sorry, uh, if uh, we could uh, maybe uh, close. Conclude the opening round so yes. we can hear coming um, on, then have a is, quick discussion. Is, is Apple born out of necessity? Yes. It was not enthusiastically welcomed and pushed and, and received with our arms wide open, and we know exactly why. Um, but but it, it's um, definitely a fundamental need of a union literally protecting uh, the pockets of, of the citizens and uh, the EU uh, funds. Uh, will it work? It truly depends on, like I said, resources on, on one um, um, hand and on the willingness of the uh, member states to sincerely cooperate and get involved in this uh, process. And I'm just finishing with one sentence. sentence. What is happening in Slovenia right now is very serious because those national delegated prosecutors um, are the ones which have the competence to investigate what is exclusively under the competence of EPO. In the case of the member states that are not part of EPO, we still have national prosecutors competent to investigate. But those, those member states that are part of the process, they do have the national delegated prosecutors for that. If, if we don't have them, you know, nobody will investigate those cases. So, um, yes. Each and every single member state has to fulfill their duties so that this whole piece is fully functioning. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. You've raised some very, very important points. I took note of a couple of them, and I hope uh, I'll have the chance to uh, to ask you a couple of quick follow-up questions uh, in the second part. Now we're going to move straight to the to our second speaker, uh, Camina Mortera Martinez, uh, for her opening in intervention. Now, she's a senior research fellow at the Center for European Reform. She works on EU justice and home affairs with a particular focus on migration, data protection, internal security, criminal law, police, and judicial cooperation. Prior to joining uh, CER, Camino worked in several projects for the European Commission as part of the justice and home affairs team of a Brussels-based consultancy. And she was particularly involved in projects dealing with free movement of persons, criminal and civil law, counterterrorism, including aviation security, police and judicial cooperation, and international private law. Camino, please, you have the floor. And after your intervention, uh, we'll take some questions from the participants. We already have two. Thank you very much for that. And I also have some questions myself. Camino, please, you have the floor. Thanks. God, I realized that's a very long bio that I have on the website. I have to change that. Um, anyway, thanks so much for uh, inviting me. and. Ramona, you said that uh, the APPO was born out of necessity and it was not necessarily very warmly welcomed by people. And I uh, count myself uh, among one of these people who was um, a very early skeptic of the APPO. To be honest, a couple of years back, I thought, why do we need an APPO for we have Olaf? You know, this is just another sort of like useless agency uh, to solve a problem that is not there in the first place. And if we do have a problem, then we, we do have the, the European Union anti-corruption agency. So why are we 
um, having yet another big body. Now I know I'm being provocative and I'm doing this on purpose, uh, not only because I am a convert, I have changed my views ever since, but also because I know it's hard to get people attention on a Zoom um, event at what I consider to be lunchtime because I'm Spanish and on a warm day like this one. But let me explain you why I change my, my, my perception. Um, it's, uh, it has two reasons. So one is like sort of professional and the other one is personal. Um, in July 2019, uh, right before going on um, to have another baby and also right before anybody thought that, you know, there was going to be a faraway virus um, changing our lives and the EU quite considerably, um, I organized a small event to talk about corruption in the European Union. Now, I didn't have any plans whatsoever to talk about the EPPO because, again, I was a septic. Um, but then, um, for some reason, we realized when we were in that, that we could not talk about corruption without talking about the EPPO. So we decided to invite one of the candidates, um, to, to then candidates, to, uh, to be a chief prosecutor, and that was uh, Laura uh, Covesi, I'm not pronouncing her name correctly, um, I'm sorry for that. And um, just the personal determination and ambition, as you, Ramona, said, of this woman who was at the moment um, fighting for her own nomination against her own government um, made me realize, you know, there is much more to this EPPO uh, thing that I thought in the first place. So that was sort of the personal um, reckoning that I had uh, about the EPPO. But then um, the pandemic happened, right? And then we had the recovery fund and we had uh, the EU's uh, record uh, budget. So we've never had a budget as big as the one we have now. And we obviously never had a recovery fund, which is an enormous pot of money, uh, which is at the same time, um, you know, like existential for the EU's future and extremely uh, difficult to oversee from the technical uh, point of view because it's earmarked for projects, but at the same time, these projects are a bit vague. So with that in mind, I, I then started realizing actually the EPPO makes a lot of sense. Now, I think there is a, a, a bit of a problem uh, when it comes to um, how the EPPO will work in the future. And this is because I like to make this analogy in between the way the EPPO came to life and the way the Euro came to life. For me, um, it's a similar um, sort of process. So in both cases, in my view, the EU put the, the, the cards before the horses by skipping several um, sort of steps of EU integration with the Euro. Uh, the Union federalized monetary policy without creating a common fiscal policy or system of banking supervision. And with the EPPO, what the European Union institutions did was fulfilling a very long time ambition of having some sort of like body with indeed competences um, to prosecute criminals without having, um, I mean, that's an, you know, like that's a, a big debate between academics, but I think um, we, we still don't have um, something resembling to um, EU criminal law, at least as we understand it on continental Europe. Um, now, this is going to be um, problematic because much as the euro, um, the EPPO will have to clear some hurdles to success. And perhaps the most important uh, one of them is, as you, Ramona, said, not all member states are part of the EPPO. We don't have Sweden, who will join apparently, hopefully, next year. We don't have Ireland and Denmark because of technical um, opt-outs of Jasta yes Homa first, but most importantly, we don't have Poland and Hungary for obvious reasons. Now that's going to make it complicated for the EPPO to uh, sort of fulfill its task of policing uh, the EU um, funds while also trying to stop democratic backsliding in the European Union, which I think it's really the most important task that the European Union will have um, in the next um, number of years. Um, now, I have two suggestions on ways to sort of overcome this problem. Obviously, you cannot force people to be part of the EPPO at the moment, because as you very well, Ramona said, this is an haste cooperation, so it's a number of member states, a coalition of the willing are sort of going with it. Uh, but you can already do something, which I think is an interesting, um, although a bit technical, um, way of sort of forcing Hungary and um, Poland to do stuff, which is using European investigation orders. 
So you know that European investigation orders are um, a core decision by one member state that sort of asks another member state judicial authority to gather or use evidence on its behalf. Once it becomes fully operational, so as of the 1st of June, hopefully become a judicial authority uh, under EU law, so it will be allowed to issue European investigation orders. And these investigation orders apply to all member states islands because of the JHA opt-outs. So in principle, the European public sub, uh, prosecutor sorry, could ask uh, Polish and Hungarian courts to carry out investigations on corruption, on the use of EU funds on its behalf. Now, what will happen with these investigations? Will the courts comply given the situation of judicial authorities, in, in, especially in Poland, uh, but also in Hungary? Instrument that the European Union could already use um, to sort of like instigate proceedings in those two member states. The second way I think, and that's I think pertains to a question that I already saw um, in the chat. Um, the second way that I think the European public prosecutor could be useful in the fight um, against uh, democratic backsliding um, is to make uh, eventually uh, joining the EPPO an obligation for member states. So it's just to go a step farther uh, when it comes to conditionality and it's it's to make it to make um, the disbursement of EU funds not only conditional on complying with the rule of law, but also on subscribing um, on having some sort of um, you know like supranational um, overseeing authority as you know a um, sort of link to the rights that you have as a member state. Now this is of course um, a very difficult and tough political sell in some countries. Um, but it's technically feasible because you can't you can't just basically uh, make it through a regulation that requires uh, qualified majority voting. Uh, now again, um, that's not to say that you know if you adopt such a regulation, it will be an easy sale. And we are seeing the conditionality mechanism is being challenged in court by uh, Budapest and Warsaw. So it's not going to be an easy thing. But these are two ideas that I just wanted to put on the table on how to overcome some of the problems that the EPPO will have. And just to finish. I would like to concur with Ramona on her assessment that in order to have a uh, efficient, sorry, effective uh, public prosecutor that is able to police uh, the EU money um, big pots and also to help, um, you know, like not to fueling more corruption, cronism and things like that. In member states, we need to have a forceful and well-resourced public prosecutor. So I think, um, you know, the most important thing for us uh, in this kind of for us is as well to push uh, for this to happen um, and, and to push for a for proper pro pro public prosecution now that we have decided um, against all odds to go for such a body, uh, we need to make. Thank you, thank you, Kamina. You broke a bit there at the end, but maybe that was just my my uh, laptop. Ramona, I saw that you raised your hand and I wanted to go straight to you after Kamina's opening intervention. She, she made some good points. She already touched upon a couple of questions that we have from our participants, which is very, very good. And that's exactly what I want to open uh, with you with the first follow-up. Also with uh, basically a question from Sofia Blanc. Do you think that it should be obligatory for all member states to join the EPPO? And is that likely to happen soon? Um, of course, you know, Camino was mentioning it. Uh, is that likely to happen soon? No, not really. I, I um, then come back to uh, Eva was born out of necessity and it was not welcomed by the people. No, 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 not by the people. Oh, people love it. They loved the idea back then and they do love it now uh, by certain governments. And if I do remember the technical trilogues and discussions that we were having ending this, this procedure back in 2017, I, you know, um, this basically is the, the most eloquent example of how welcomed actually the idea was by certain, like I said, governments and um, which is only natural uh, because uh, investigation and, 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 and fairness in expenditure uh, is, is something that uh, if, if governments do not do properly, of course, they would not want to be investigated about that, uh, which is a problem not ours because ours is to actually guard EU money. I, I did see 
Um, a question there referring to what legislation applies and so on, and I'd like to address is we do have the regulation from October 2017 setting up this enhanced cooperation for the, um, uh, the, the prosecutor's office. But we, and I, I pointed it out in my speech, but I'm, I'm saying it again, basically EPO is one single office operating under 22 different criminal procedural regimes. Uh, if we refer to this, uh, uh, this member states, uh, part of it, part of the enhanced cooperation, yes, 140 prosecutors across the EU, uh, decentralized way of, of, of working 22 different languages, plus the, the, the cooperation with third countries. So yes, obviously, this is a huge challenge. Um, and about the orders um, uh, coming up. They do function well, and my feedback, the feedback that I, I receive uh, is that they are actually quite efficient. I've had discussions with Romanian specialists recently about that. They were quite thrilled about the way they work. Uh, will the Hungarian and, and, and Polish authorities do it and respond? Well, that's a quite a different question. Um, I'm, I'm very curious myself, uh, following some, some concrete cases, uh, maybe to find out if this, this this will happen or or not. Anyway, it, it is a beautiful challenge and I, we should just move ahead with it. Maybe make sure that it proper, properly functions and it is set up first before thinking of how we expand competencies and so on, because this is a discussion. Again, I'd be really careful about that. I would have it set up properly functioning with good results you know, have 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 it, have the the the, the spinning and then see seeing it rolling, and and working, and then think about how to to expand uh, competencies. Thank you. Raona, thank you very much for that. Camino, before I go back to you, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, Ramona, you only have one or two minutes left before you have to jump to your other meeting. So I want to pose one final question to you just to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, as we're meeting today here to talk about EPPO, uh, Laura Kudzakovic is doing her first official visit uh, since the EPPO was launched on the 1st of uh, June and she went to Bulgaria as uh, her first official visit. So I just wanted to basically quickly pick your brain, ask your, ask your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's excellent because Bulgaria, not the Bulgarian government, but the Bulgarian people have been calling for it for a very long time. And Bulgaria took to the streets, if you remember, in the past months and year uh, against corruption and for the rule of law and for a clear action of the European Commission and the European institutions uh, in order to preserve this 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 values and to 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 do something really concrete to support their their fight. So I I truly think that with all of the signals the um, the the results of the investigative um, journalists actually because we have seen plenty of stories from there with with sufficient proof uh, and, and all of the data that they have now at this point um, that's just. I believe it is a fair thing to do, and with all the the the, the, the and the number of potential cases and so on. So um, I I think that this is an excellent signal, uh, to be honest, and I truly hope that we will see results uh, after these investigations uh, as well. Because as 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 I mentioned, I know it is so important to the to the people, and we actually are responding in our mandate to them, not to various governments. Indeed. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I don't know how long you can uh, stay uh, with us in this in this webinar. I'm looking a bit at the clock. Uh, but uh, we if you have- run right now, actually in one minute, but I <laughs> truly would like to thank you very much for, for being able to, to participate. Really happy to, to join uh, when you organize other uh, discussions as well. Um, very happy to meet Camino uh and uh, and hopefully we'll be able to to meet uh during like real conferences and and you know physical physical in person uh circumstances and and talk about it because it is a very complex topic and i i truly would like us to see one step at a time 
which is the direction and what is uh, functioning and what we need to do more. Thank you again, and, uh, and good luck with the continuation of the discussion. Thank you very much, Ramona, and best of luck with your, with your meetings and with all your work in the, in the parliament. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Camino, I'm coming back to, to you now. Um, do you want to reply to anything Ramona mentioned? Uh, I also have one more question for you, and I think we can also tackle some of the questions left in the Q&A from the participants before we, uh, before we move to close this webinar. So yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, just very quickly, um, I think Ramona was right in saying that um, there was a, a lot of opposition from member states. Um, so I was not referring to like me as a person, you know, like being opposed to the EPPO, like going campaigning uh, somewhere. Uh, it's just that there was a lot of um, doubts um, on the criminal law, so European criminal law um, area for a long time, ever since, um, I think it was like 20 years ago when, when, when we started talking about um, the sort of corpus jury and all these sort of things. Um, there was a lot of um, yeah, doubts about, you know, whether or not a, an EPPO was really necessary. And I think my, my, my point on that was that I think a lot of people has changed their mind even you know, legal experts, um, regardless of how complicated um, the whole structure is and how complicated it will, it will be to actually make it work, um, because precisely because um, of the recovery fund and the link in between um, sort of corruption, uh, chronism, and democratic backsliding. I think um, that's been a big like paradigm ch change uh, in the minds of lots of people. Um, and I think that includes governments uh, and like, experts in governments as well. No, indeed. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to also, uh, I know Ramona already touched a bit upon this, but to focus on the question maybe from Bernardo Connor and hear your, uh, your opinion, from, given your legal background and your legal expertise, uh, to the laws that apply to the prosecutions of the new office. Now he stays the financial regulation Article 136, but does this mean that we have a single prosecutor and eventually 27 months? I know Ramon already touched a bit upon this, but I just wanted to ask for your, uh, for your legal input on this one. Right, I'm not entirely sure what's, what regula regulation he's talking about. I was looking at the PIF directives, the protection of um, uh, yes. financial interest uh, within the French acronism. acronism. Mm -hmm basis for um, the EPPO. And basically what happens is that um, national law does apply because we're talking about decentralized. It, that's why the whole thing is very complicated and there is you know, lots of doubts on how this is going to work. Like the European Union does not have the competences to have a European criminal law code and, 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 let, and let alone a European criminal uh, procedural code. Um, so you cannot sort of like decide on the basis of EU law um, to prosecute criminals because there is no such a thing as EU criminal law, once again. What he can do, though, is to um, instruct national prosecutors, so the delegated prosecutors in the EPPO, um, to actually apply uh, national law, which should be harmonized because there is the PIF uh, regulation, but also because there is a number of other EU instruments uh, there which harmonize uh, laws at the national level. So it's not that there are 27 different laws. Hopefully, there should be 27 different laws which look very much alike because we have harmonization of proceedings. And it's only in the field of the protection of the financial interests of the union. Um, so that's the reason why the EPPO is there in the first place. You cannot have, or at least not now, you cannot have a, a EU body with competences to deal with crimes um, which do not touch uh, European Union interests uh, simply because you don't have, uh, you know, a European Union competence. Um, so to answer that question, um, indeed, I mean, we don't have a European Union corpus jury, so to speak, uh, which I, that's what I was referring to before. Uh, but hopefully, um, and again, that's a, a presumption that we always had. And now we're starting to doubt as well because of the way things are going in some new countries. Um, hopefully, all these uh, delegated prosecutors should be applying uh, roughly similar uh, laws which have been harmonized under uh, European Union criteria. 
No, indeed. Thank you very much for that. And I see that uh, Bernard wrote the follow-up question on that, and we'll take it now to, to just finish with that kind of topic before moving on to the next question. What law applies to the conduct of the prosecutors themselves? Right. I'm not sure um, what he means there, but I think, I mean, I think that um, there are two different, two different answers um, to this. So obviously, the delegated prosecutors have to abide uh, to their mandates um, under the EPPO. That's the reason why they're there. So they have a code of conduct and, you know, like loyalty to the institution and, and this kind of thing. Um, again, um, I think that um, lots of the assumptions that we had when, you know, this whole thing was put together um, can be challenged now because things like we never thought were going to happen. Like, for example, you know, Polish courts actually declaring that um, their, their ma magistrates cannot ask preliminary questions to the ECJ, which is like unthinkable um, for any new lawyer. Um, so these kind of things also make us question, right? It's like we are sort of like um, assuming that these people will behave according to national law, according to the independence of the judiciary, and according to a number of criteria that you know um, they have because they're members of the European Union and especially because they are members of the area of human security and justice, which is based on the fact that every single legal uh, system um, is sort of equivalent um, to, 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 to any other um, member states because of the principle of mutual trust. Uh, now, can we still assume that? That's a, that's a good question. And I guess that, you know, like those countries with the biggest problems um, are not part of the European of the European public prosecutor. But I would like to remind you that there are other countries where we are seeing problems with um, with the way that the government is sort of treating um, the judiciary. And I'm sorry to mention Romania, but um, this is one of them. Uh, we, we saw a, a recent ECA ruling uh, on the cre creation of special a prosecutor um, to um, to rule on on, on sort of judges uh, conduct, which is problematic, um, and Romania is part of the European Public Prosecutor. So yes, I mean they are supposed to be following uh, EU um, sort of rules, but um, will they? I mean that's that's an open question, and that's a very interesting one to to, to sort of like monitor in the future. Yes, no, indeed. Well, thank you very much for mentioning that. I actually wanted to bring that as an example, uh, the situation from uh, my country and the latest ruling from the ECJ regarding that. Um, I personally hope that uh, the, the new government will just improve the situation and we'll, we'll get back on the right track, if I can call it like that. But um, indeed, I think, I think as, as it is uh, a new body in a lot of uh, aspects, I think uh, we will have to give it a bit of time in order to maybe iron out all the kinks and like uh, uh, make sure that everything is streamlined and, and operational. And before, before I move to the last question from Gabriel Parat, talking about operational, this is something that both you and Ramona mentioned. I wanted to quickly ask, in your opinion, do you have like a ballpark figure? of what this, this uh, new independent body needs in terms of resources in, in to actually function and to actually complete its mission successfully. Now, I know it's a, I know it's a very open question and if we can talk about any number, but I'm just, I'm just out of curiosity. I'm just asking you if you, if you have a ballpark figure. I think you're still muted. I, I I don't. I think um, what was it around Christmas? Um, vo both uh, Reinders and and Covesi were doing like a very funny um, press round asking for money, um, and they were talking about like I don't know. I don't, don't remember like three million euros or whatever, which is not much. Um, but I think what they actually um, want is to have a proper cooperation. That's what, what when when, we, when you talk to them, that's what what they sort of like. Um, bring up so, so it's not a question it's, it's a question of money of course but it's also a question of how efficient uh, member states are being in sort of helping this body to you know operate um, and that includes you know the council uh, of ministers of course council of the european union and, and, and the money that the, the council 
um, wants to give them. And, and I know that the European Parliament uh, pushed for a raise in the MFF. So that was a good thing. But that also includes, um, you know, cases like the Slovenian um, um, question that, um, that Ramona was mentioning. Uh, which is a big thing, and it's a big problem. <laughs> and um, without, you know, getting to that stream of like governments again blocking uh, the, the nomination of, of judges of being really slow. Uh, I remember the Maltese were very slow in nominating somebody as well. Um, then you need to have a proper cooperation, proper and sincere cooperation of judicial authorities and 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 justice ministers all around the EU. And I think that's something that's you know for them. Has not been easy and um also you know like setting shop in luxembourg in the midst of a pandemic and stuff um was also not not necessarily a very easy thing to do no indeed and you 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 raise and you and allow me to do the transition out to the last question uh, you already touched a bit about about the slovenia case and the importance of uh, cooperation from the member states as well as from the eu institutions um but I would like to maybe spend a couple of more minutes on the Slovenia case because I'm just afraid that it might uh, set a bad precedent for other countries for the next round of nomination of uh, European prosecutors and so on and so forth, where uh, another country at another election in the future, elections go in a certain way and then we wake up having uh, Slovenia the Slovenia case all over again with a different country. Now, why I'm asking this is to go to Gabriel's uh, question, what leverages and incentives does the EU have or should the EU have maybe uh, in order to avoid these scenarios, in order for a country to actually appoint the European delegated prosecutors and not, not uh, drag it out or actually um, put even more obstacles in the functioning of uh, the EPPO. And I'm going to finish off with the second part of Gabriel's question. If EPPO will be able to prosecute the misuse of funds in Slovenia. Slovenia, OK, it's a member of the EPPO. But I think the, the more important question is about Hungary and Poland uh, in light of the new budget coming soon. So please, uh, floor is yours, Camino. Right. So. Um... Two different questions and two different problems, um, both of them related. So what's happening in Slovenia is very worrying, right? Um, and one of the things that I think people are trying to do is to raise the issue of, we've been here, we've done this, and it hasn't gone very well. Um, so what is that we can do now that we're seeing, you know, slow, but but sure path towards um, a liberal democracy, whatever that means, what is that we can do to stop it before it becomes a Poland sized problem? And I think part of the answer, um, not only about the EPPO, I think the EPPO is sort of the last um, provocation of, of, of uh, Mr. Jansa, but there have been many others, um, especially with regards to civil society, uh, freedom of expression and things like that. I think the answer is that we sort of need to make it clear for everybody, um, both at home, but also in Brussels, that belonging to the area of freedom, security and justice, and I, I am sorry to insist on this, I, I know that it's a very technical a concept, but at the end of the day, um, when you talk about the internal markets, everybody understands that if you're a member of the internal markets, um, you have a number of rights, but you also have a number of obligations. Uh, you cannot, uh, you know, manufacture random stuff because you have to follow EU um, directives on how to bottle um, water so that you can sell it somewhere else. Um, in the same way that you are a member of the Eurozone, and for being a member of the Eurozone, you have to respect a number of criteria, which, you know, can, can um, depending on what political spectrum you come from, can or cannot be stupid, um, but there are these criteria and there is a very tight oversight on whether or not you, you, know, you actually comply with these criteria. So the European semester and all these sort of things. I do believe we need a European semester for the area of freedom, security and justice. And that includes a number of things, not only 
um, related to um, the EPPO, so belonging to the EPPO, but also making sure that you appoint somebody to do the job, because otherwise, hey, what's the point? Um, but also a number of other things, like making uh, very clear that yeah, like Schengen membership is also related to having a common uh, migration and security policy, um, and that cannot be, uh, you know, separate stuff. Um, so in the same way that, you know, you have, you cannot kick people out of the euro, but you have a number of measures that you can apply um, so that, you know, it will be slightly painful for, for, for countries not to follow uh, the rules, I think, uh, but that's a different and, and like longer discussion, I think that a measure, um, eventually, we will need to have an overseeing mechanism for all these things, including uh, membership of the EPPO, and that's something that um, the Treaty of Lisbon allows for, so they will not, we will not need to have um, a treaty change or anything like that, it's Article 70, and uh, we could, you know, eventually have a serious, um, a serious oversight and a, and a serious set of criteria uh, without which you cannot be part um, of the area of freedom, security and justice, or indeed be part of um, the disbursement of EU funds. It would be ridiculous to think um, in any member state or in any country, uh, however illiberal it is, that you could uh, use EU money or government money without nobody auditing it. To me, um, that spells, um, you know, dictatorship and, 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 and very dodgy countries, not uh, what the European Union should be. So, um, in my opinion, eventually, you will have to have uh, conditionality taken all the way to joining the EPPO if you want to be, to be part of that. Um, so that's sort of like the incentive leverage, um, so to speak. At the same time, uh, one of the things that I think Ovesi and others are considering um, is if Slovenia really refuses to nominate, um, this is, these are the national uh, prosecutors, by the way, yeah? um, if Slovenia uh, refuses to nominate um, the people who are supposed to be doing the job in the country, um, they will channel all Slovenian cases through um, the delegated prosecutor, which is already in place, the Slovenian delegated prosecutor. Um, so that's sort, sort of like the, 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 um, the solution that they, are, that they are trying to find. Um, now, will the EPPO be able to police um, funds in Hungary and Poland? Uh, no, unless they do, you know, they, they, they use this uh, European investigation orders. And I understand Ramon's point that you need a properly established uh, body before you start, you know, tweaking with rules and, and, and going a bit farther. Um, now, I'm very, very sure when I talk to the Commission uh, that the Commission intends to be really on top of uh, Romania, sorry, not Romania, but what? Well, yes, Romania, Bulgaria, whatever, um, Hungary, Poland, but also Spain, uh, Greece, whoever, on the recovery funds. Um, I think they are planning to, 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 to be really strict and to oversee that really the funds are used for what they're supposed to be used for and to avoid the mistakes that they had in the past. Um, so I sort of like hope that with the commission's, you know, overseeing um, mechanism and also with the promise that they have uh, made, which is that they will review um, how the, the funds are used every six months. And if they find deficiencies, uh, they will stop the funding. Um, I think with that and with the hopeful um, uh, coming into force of the conditionality mechanism uh, later this year, if the ECJ, <laughs> ECJ um, um, you know, decides to allow it, um, I think we'll be able to, to have a proper uh, policing of the recovery fund. And I think that um, people in Brussels, the people in power, understand very well um, how much is at stake with the recovery funds uh, for Europe's reputation and, and for the future of the project itself. So they have an interest in making sure that you know it's properly used in every single country, whether or not they belong to the EPPO. Well, Camino, thank you very, very much for that. That was a that was an amazing answer, and uh, I think I think you made some very, very important points on on both questions. And with that, we finished the questions from the from the participants, which I'm very happy. And we're also coming to the end of this webinar, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask you the same final question that I asked uh, Ramona, uh, just to just to see with a bit of a twist. Uh, what do you think of the European Chief Prosecutor's uh, Ms. Koveshi's first visit being to Bulgaria? And I'm just curious, where do you think she should do her second visit? She should go back home. Um... <laughs> 
I think, I think, I mean, I think she's, she's just a very powerful woman. Um, I think she's trying to send the right message. But I think one thing that um, it's important for me, also as a Western European, sort of Southern European, um, older member state uh, person to, to sort of um, make sure that we, 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 we insist on is that corruption and chronism and, you know, rule of law problems happen to everybody. It's like, you know, bad hair happens to good people. Um, corruption and rule of law problems, um, unfortunately, you know, can happen um, everywhere. So we have to remain vigilant. And I think one thing that we should avoid doing um, here in Brussels is to sort, sort of single out uh, specific nationalities. And one thing that to me is very important, I think uh, Ms. Covesi um, has it very clear and, and, and she's working about uh, on that, is that when we talk about you know, problems with the rule of law or, or, or problems uh, with the way um, money is used in this and, this and that country, um, we are talking about governments and governments are temporary, people are not. So I, you know, I, I really think that we should consider, and, and that's, that's the approach I think the European Union is taking that, um, you know, like this is not a fight against Poland or Hungary or Romania or Malta or Cyprus or whatever. Uh, this is a fight against people in power who believe that they can do whatever they want. And these people, you know, are right now, they're in the Polish government, they're in the Hungarian government, but hey, I mean, the, the commission has just taken um, the German, uh, you know, constitutional court to court. Um, so, so you never know where, you know, problems are gonna come are going to come from and there are different levels of problems of course um but it's just that if you if you if you don't stop the narrative of this is a fight against poland and hungary uh but this is a fight against this and this government and this and these people then the problem is that you might you know help alienating voters in there and actually uh, make the problem even worse so i think that's a very important message uh for us to sort of like put out there i know that is a very very good ending message on which uh, we're going to bring this webinar to a close. Uh, indeed, uh, we should be fighting against uh, people, politicians, individuals, businessmen who are acting with impunity uh, rather than uh, blaming nationalities for what their uh, politicians at that moment in time are doing. Uh, that's, a, that's a very strong message and I think it's a very good one uh just to sum up a bit there was a lot of uh, we see a lot of need for more cooperation from the member states from the institutions not just coming down to the to an increased budget but also cooperation when it comes to the actual operations in order for the eppo to be a successful thing uh many ideas from the eios new european semester overseeing mechanisms some very, very good points that were made, and I hope that our participants will, will take home with them and will share them with their colleagues as well. Camino, thank you very, very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to, to have had this meeting uh, during your lunch, <laughs> during your lunch time, but it's I'm okay. very happy. It's three, so that's perfect Spanish lunch time now. I'm gonna have lunch now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very happy to hear that. So thank you again for, for staying with us uh, until now. A big thank you to MEP Ramana Sugariu who joined us for the first half of this uh, webinar. We welcome her back uh, all the time with a smile and we're glad that she was able to, to join us for this important session. Thank you to all the participants. You will be able to find the recording on our YouTube channel and on the ELF event page of this specific uh, webinar. And I will leave you with uh, a bit of information about our upcoming things. Talking about rule of law, uh, ELF is launching a new project, the Europe of Values, and we have our first event next week, which will have a look in particular at the CVM in Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, was it good? Was it bad? Uh, what are the lessons learned from that and how can we move forward? And we're happy to welcome again Ramon Astrogariu as a speaker for this uh, panel on the 16th of June. Uh, more information on the ELF website if you're interested on the CVM in Romania and Bulgaria. And a quick note on our next On the Agenda webinar, which will take place on 24th of June. Uh, 
uh, in the aftermath of the upcoming EU-US summit and of President, Biden, President Biden's first visit to Europe, we're going to have an on-the-agenda webinar looking at EU-US relations with a particular focus on uh, the future Trade and Technology Council. So if you're interested in that, you already have more information on the ELF website, you have a registration link already, and we look forward to welcoming you there again. Thank you very, very much, Camino. Wish you a very nice lunch. Uh, everybody, if you have lunch, afternoon, coffee, wish you all the best and see you next time. Thank you. Bye.